Media technologies seem to be everywhere, assisting us in or invading each and every corner of our daily existence. We've already discussed how this ubiquity is embedded into a huge range of physical infrastructures, environments where media technologies surround us. And yet, we also increasingly carry media around with us, in our pockets, hands, ears, across our eyes, around our wrists. We wear media like clothes, and we may soon implant media within our bodies. This need not be seen in the guise of science fiction. It is more interesting to see it as really quite ordinary. For a long time, we humans have shared an intimacy with media technologies. They not only affect how we see ourselves, but modulate and help produce who and what we are. Media Technology and Culture is a podcast series by me, Scott Rogers. In this series, we'll be taking a thematic look at media, understood as technologies. We explore the histories of media, as well as more recent developments, and not always necessarily in a linear progression. Some of you listeners will be students on my module, Media Technology and Culture, in which we'll discuss and work on some of these themes in more detail. This is the second edition of the series, which includes some new elements added to the episode in autumn 2021. In this episode, the seventh in our series, we focus on embodied technologies. The key idea I want to get across is this. It seems inevitable that future technologies will be more and more embodied, perhaps even embedded into our bodies. But we should be careful not to exaggerate the novelty of this. We have long been intimately entangled with media. We should start by averting possible confusion about what we mean by embodied technologies, at least for the purposes of this episode. We do not necessarily mean technologies given a bodily form so that they can better interact with us in a variety of settings. In the field of artificial intelligence, this is sometimes called embodied agents. These are kinds of physical or graphically represented bodies that interact with us. The discontinued Microsoft agent, for example, allowed you to create cartoonish characters that could interact with website users. Of course, embodied agents would also include androids. The sense of technological embodiment we're going to work with here follows up on what we introduced in episode one, when we discussed post-humanist perspectives. A post-human perspective sees technologies as akin to prosthetics, like artificial parts of our bodies. This was a perspective shared with McLuhan, who saw media as extensions. In their 2012 book, Life After New Media, Kember and Zielinska stressed that this means thinking about media, thinking about all technologies, as inherently tied to being human. Media are not external to and affecting some pre-mediated or pre-technical human. Being human means acting and thinking through technologies. We seem to be reaching a point in which ideas about acting and thinking through technologies akin to prosthetics requires less and less imagination or critical reflection. Terms like embodied media and body media are increasingly spoken within futurist discourses about not-so-distant technologies blurring distinctions between flesh and machine, mind and computer. A future in which media technologies are embodied because they are literally implanted into our bodies. To be sure, implanting technologies into our bodies is and will be significant. But making this the implicit criteria for us to think of media technologies as embodied is also consoling. It reassures us that we humans currently have autonomy from technologies. Perhaps it even gives us permission to retain those comfortable binaries we were advised to dispense of in episode one between technology and use, technology and culture, and technology and humans. But remember, The point made by many media scholars is that we are already and have long been entangled with media. We don't need to look at particularly new media to see this. Let's briefly consider print media. 
Adriana D'Souza y Silva and Jordan Frith note in their 2012 book, Mobile Interfaces in Public Spaces, that print media have not always been mobile. Early book reading predominantly took place in libraries, where heavy hardback texts sat on reading desks. The elaborate book wheel, illustrated in 1588 by Italian military engineer Agostino Romelli, was intended to allow readers to deal with several such unwieldy books while remaining seated. Paperback books and newspapers were revolutionary in part because they were mobile. They reshaped reading practices in many ways, and particularly amongst commuters in industrializing cities. As D'Souza, Isilva, and Frith observe, upper-class Victorian commuters were especially anxious about facing one another on long train journeys. Newspaper and book reading offered a desirable form of embodied coping. It is not dissimilar to how we sometimes use mobile sound technologies today. Media became what Irving Goffman called involvement shields. We could look at a whole gamut of embodied media entanglements, but let us maintain the focus we've been building up in the last few episodes around broadly computational technologies. It is, after all, a pretty reasonable bet that you right now have a little computer nearby, one you unthinkingly bring almost everywhere you go. We mean, of course, your smartphone, assuming you have one. We have an intimate relationship with smartphones, and many other computational technologies today. To properly grasp this, we need to somewhat shift our approach. We need to momentarily turn some of our attention away from all that software, hardware, and infrastructures, and think about how computation intersects with our psychology, emotions, and affects. One of the preeminent thinkers on this subject is Sherry Turkle, whose large body of work focuses on human entanglement with technology and particularly computational objects. Her 1984 book, The Second Self, argued that computers do not just change what we do, they change how we think and see ourselves. Let's start with the humble mobile phone. Remember these? The mobile devices, which were mainly used for voice calls and text messages? Perhaps a low-res photo here or a basic video game there? We should start with the mobile phone, not so much for their narrow technical qualities, but what scholars have argued they embody culturally. Mobile phones presented a new iteration of something familiar, the doubling of space. We discussed this in relation to television in episode 2. Early television can be considered a doubling of space, in which viewers situated in private settings are connected to a public world. For example, being presented images of inner-city issues from the seclusion of a suburban home. In some ways, mobile phones did the reverse. They helped us bring private spaces into public settings. And in so doing, they raised a series of questions about existing norms of public etiquette such as the appropriateness of taking a call during a restaurant meal. Mobile phones were also an interesting case study of user-led domestication and invention. Recall Lisa Gittleman's appeal in her 2006 book, Always Already Knew, for us to think about media use as a form of production. She showed how female homemakers effectively made the phonograph into a new form of music media. Now, think about the deep impact of texting practices, emerging especially from how younger people used mobile devices for communication with friends. This has deeply impacted how we use social media, messaging apps, the development of predictive text, and autocomplete affordances, all thanks to inventive practices born from the embodied situation of cradling this small device in one's hand, tapping away at tiny numbered buttons. User practices also had a role to play in the transition of the mobile phone from interpersonal communication device to media platform. This is the claim made by May and Hearn in their article titled The Mobile Phone as Media. The fact that this article is from 2005 is significant. It's two years before a major transformation was about to arrive in mobile technology. This is a change we will come to shortly, But that change did not miraculously and suddenly render mobile phones into media. This was a longer process. 
Since the late 1990s, mobile phones were increasingly being customized and personalized by their users with simple monophonic ringtones, changeable plastic covers, and hand-knit cozies. By the early 2000s, 3G connectivity, certain data processing capacities, cameras, and icon-driven media centers were also beginning to appear. Mayenhern argued that these processes already represented an abstraction of mobile phones from their original intended purpose. They became media that were personalized and aestheticized. Users had developed more intimate relationships, embodied relationships, with their mobiles, beyond their functioning as transparent mediums of interpersonal communication. More and more, they became an identity extension, an accoutrement to the person. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. On 9th of January, 2007, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs made a presentation at Macworld San Francisco. Almost straight away, he toyed with the audience, claiming that he was launching three devices at this event. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod. A phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. The iPhone was not the first smartphone, but it was a device which alerted everyone to this emergent media technology. Smartphone is a portmanteau, a fused word which amalgamates new and old. Its first element, smart, is a prefix that is today usually associated with computation, but also, of course, with cleverness. With phone, we are given something more familiar, the residual media, the remediated object, with which this device shares some properties and surface resemblances. James Miller, in a 2014 article in the journal Mobile Media and Communication, suggests we think about the smartphone as a potentially illuminating theory object. Not only might we attempt to better understand the smartphone, he says, or give it context using existing theoretical perspectives, The smartphone itself might also encourage us to ask new and broader conceptual questions about media and mediated experience more generally. One of Miller's main arguments is that smartphones embody a broader shift away from media as material devices to media as a set of embedded functionalities. What he means is that smartphones are not just small computers. They are not just little metamediums to restate the notion identified with Manovich in episode 5. Rather, for Miller, smartphones might indicate a shift to media being embedded into both the body as well as built environments. Miller frames the ubiquity of smartphones under the banner of mediatization. At the most general level, mediatization refers to the difficulty we experience today in distinguishing between mediated and non-mediated experiences. Smartphones, he says, might be understood as bridging technologies. This is to say we should think about what they might be taking us partway towards, a situation in which media are so ubiquitous that they become incorporated into and indistinguishable from our bodies and physical environments. Perhaps, via smartphones, computing is finally becoming well and truly ubiquitous. To adapt a well-known quote from computer scientist Mark Weiser, who led experiments in so-called Ubicomp at Xerox Park in the 1980s and 90s, smartphones might be one of those profound technologies that disappear, 
Rather than having to sit in front of a stationary machine, perhaps with smartphones, we finally have computing woven into the fabric of everyday life until it becomes indistinguishable from it. But for Miller, even if smartphones are bridging technologies, it is not reducible to their technical features. It also has to do with their intimate entanglements with us. These are devices we hold, really cradle, in our hands. We keep them in our pockets. Their screen might illuminate our face in a darkened room just before we go to sleep. You and I might not want to admit it, but the smartphone we hold may be rather like what Turkle calls evocative objects. Quote, we think with the objects we love. We love the objects we think with. End quote. Miller suggests that the smartphone makes obvious the problems with the idea of a purely biological mind. According to philosophers such as Andy Clark, humans are, quote, natural-born cyborgs, end quote. How we think, and even to a degree what we think, or at least can think, is entirely interwoven with non-biological forms. So the smartphone might be seen as a continuation of humans having an extended mind. In the long term, the smartphone itself might be regarded as a relatively primitive version of such cognitive externalization. If you've ever lost your smartphone or accidentally left it at home, you might have been encouraged to recognize this. In such an instance, you are not only left without your smartphone device, you are left without all of your acquired habits that depend on your mind, body, and device working in sync. For example, how you navigate around the city, make arrangements or keep in touch with friends, pay for things, fill in time with music or interesting podcasts about media technology and culture, or take photos, not just to make memories, but maybe to avoid writing something down. Losing or misplacing a device like this can be like losing part of your body and mind, as long as you are willing to think of body and mind as including external things, things not permanently connected to you or implanted into you. It is true that we like to think of ourselves as separate from our devices. Maybe we even consider it an ethical imperative to think this way. And yet, with many smartphone accessories, the separation is blurry. Increasingly small and discreet Bluetooth headphones are a good example. In a 2018 piece in The Atlantic, Ian Bogost noted how Bluetooth headsets are an omen for something deeper. It is worth quoting Bogost at length here. After an hour wearing such headphones, he observes how he loses, quote, the sensation they occupy in my oracle. Unlike the corded buds, there's no need to untether myself from the phone when I get up to do something else. I'm in the kitchen, making a coffee. Then I'm outside, getting the mail. I might or might not be listening to music or talking on the phone, but it doesn't matter anymore. I could be, at any time, and without impediment. I could also pose questions to or initiate tasks to Siri. I am connected to the phone, and therefore the world, without being tethered to it directly. End quote. Bogus notes that headsets like Apple's AirPods are still obtrusive. They look, he says, quote, a little ridiculous. White sprouts hang down an inch below the ears where the cords would attach. But eventually it won't matter, as people will get used to everyone having wireless buds stuck in their ears. Not like they're used to wired earbuds in the train or on the sidewalk or at the dog park. No, more like they're used to people staring at phones all the time, everywhere. The earbuds won't disappear, just like the smartphones haven't. But they will become invisible as they become ubiquitous. Human focus, already ambiguously cleft between world and screen, will become split again, even when maintaining eye contact. End quote. You're hearing one of the fanciful conceptual walkthrough videos produced for Google Glass. The user, just awakened, has their hands occupied with things like making coffee and eating a breakfast sandwich, but their appointments for the day, weather and so on, appear in their field of vision. Google Glass was a less successful wearable, 
at least as far as mass market devices go. Essentially, it was a pair of glasses as computer interface. It made use of an optical head mounted display, voice commands, and a small swiping interface on one of the temples. Its early prototype required a smartphone link, which allowed it to offer a series of apps which might be useful within the user's field of vision. For example, navigation, sporting data like golf course information, real time translation, recipes, and of course, photography. Actually, concerns about surreptitious photography was one of the reasons the prototype ran aground. But Google is still working on Glass. Its current focus is on an enterprise edition, designed for workplace applications. Smart Glasses have found a more niche user base via social media platforms. Snapchat's pared-down spectacles build camera lenses into sunglasses, which can record short videos that then, via a smartphone, sync back with the user's Snapchat profile. Ray-Ban's Stories smart glasses, which are modeled on the company's classic Wayfarer design, offer a very similar functionality to Snapchat's spectacles, but are designed to work with Facebook and Instagram. Longer term, Facebook's, or should we say Meta's, sites are apparently set on devising glasses for a fuller augmented reality experience, perhaps for use in the metaverse to come. But again, we should be mindful not to overfocus on questions of physical embodiment, such as these smartphone functionalities being extended into our eyes or into our ears. Just as important are the ways in which smartphone functionalities are intimately entangled with our identity. Indeed, as Miller suggests, the smartphone has become a kind of individualization machine. We know from thinkers like Irving Goffman and Judith Butler that we should think about identity not as something we have, but as something we do. Identity is an ongoing practical or performative achievement. Miller mentions the work of Zygmunt Bauman, who described a historical shift in which personal identity has evolved from a given to a task. And here, the smartphone is potentially central. Think about smartphone cameras. Miller cites Daniel Palmer's observation that front and rear-facing cameras allow smartphone screens to, quote, alternate between a window and a mirror and function as a life recorder, end quote. At least potentially, this supports human existence becoming a DIY or choice biography. It makes possible, even invites one to keep a narrative going and actively construct one's identity. Our entanglements with mobile media are not just a case of us more or less consciously sharing and accessing information with our eyes, ears, or digits. Increasingly, we are also entangled through devices that, in the background, track our bodily metrics. One of the most obvious forms in this respect are wrist-wearable tracking devices such as Fitbit or Apple Watch. These technologies are in many ways closely related to smartphones, and not only because wrist wearables usually need to sync with them. They also extend the ecology of apps from smartphone to body, and through that ergonomic connection, change how the app is used. Of course, like the smartphone, they also nod at a prior media form, in this case the watch, as an entree to the new. James Gilmore, in a 2016 article in the journal New Media and Society, suggests that wrist wearable tracking devices are an instance of everywhere, W-E-A-R, itself a subvariant of what Adam Greenfield describes in his 2006 book, Everywhere, W-A-R-E. Wrist wearables are not just pervasive, but since you wear them on your body, they connect closely and largely non-consciously to your daily routines. In short, Gilmore says, they invite you to wear a routine. Although wrist wearable devices often include a range of functionalities, their chief selling feature is their biometric capacities. With features such as GPS, barometric altimeters, accelerometers, compasses, and sensors, they can detect your movements and heart rate. But as Kate Crawford and her co authors point out in a 2015 article in the European Journal of Cultural Studies, physical quantification by external means is not in itself new. A distinct but related historical instance, they observe, would be the weight scale. 
The weight scales moved through a series of different spaces. Initially, they were mainly used in doctor's offices. But by the late 19th century, penny scales began popping up in public spaces, allowing people to discover their numeric weight, often alongside the sound of a ringing bell or popular song. In the early 20th century, interest grew in having scales within the home. And here, a more private and intimate relationship with weighing oneself became possible. Personal uses of weight scales provides an example which shares some similarities with the use of wrist-wearing tracking devices. Both entail, for instance, a practical commitment to accurate and repetitious self-monitoring. But what is most useful about Crawford et al.'s historicization are the differences it highlights as well. One of the most important differences between weighing oneself and wearable self-tracking technologies is the nature of their data and its valuation. With the weight scale, your data is largely private, and it has an individual use value. You may need to pay for it, but it is more of a one-off payment. For instance, buying the scale that will give you this data, or putting the penny into the public apparatus. Most wearable technologies, by contrast, involve terms of use governing the data created through the process of tracking. These govern how your data can be collected, aggregated, shared, potentially reused, even sold. At the very least, your data is needed to make different aspects of the tracking app work, for you individually, but also for users. Wearable self-tracking technologies therefore not only involve a personal use value, but also an exchange value. While you might pay for the device itself, you also pay by agreeing to give over some of your data. Mummy, what's that? Vitality sent my new Apple Watch. So now, when I exercise, it measures what I do and I get all these points. It has cool stuff. At Vitality Health and Life Insurance, we like to share the benefits of healthy living. Oxygen levels Mm. attract my elevation. So you can get an Apple Watch Series 6 from just £37 with nothing more to pay when you stay active. Health insurance is quickly becoming one obvious area in which users exchange biometric data for financial return. In recent years in the UK, Vitality Insurance has offered potential customers the latest Apple Watch for as little as one-tenth of the price, provided they stay active, as evidenced by sharing their captured health data. Another key difference between an example like the weight scale and many uses of wearable technologies is the relationships of public and private. Many users of wearables willingly share their data with others. Runners and cyclists with accounts on, for example, Strava or Endemondo, connect with friends and allow their metrics to be shared. Algorithms on these apps further aggregate and compare your data with others. Will you hold on to that title as top runner on Road X during Y time period? Crawford and her co-author suggest that there is an interesting re-articulation of public and private with wearable technologies. They draw on American cultural historian Hillel Schwartz, who in his 1986 book, Never Satisfied, points out that as the weight scale moved from doctor's office to public space to private home, there was, quote, a semantic shift from the third person to the second person, and from the declarative to the conditional, from what this person weighs to what you should weigh and what you could be, end quote. Wearable technologies seem to reinstate such a third person, public and sociable dimension, alongside a declarative second and first person as well. The use of self-tracking wearables seems to indicate an instance of what Michel Foucault called technologies of the self, which, quote, permit individuals to effect by their own means or with the help of others a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls, thoughts, conduct, and way of being, so as to transform themselves in order to attain a certain sense of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality, end quote. And here there is one close similarity between the historical example of the weight scale and self-tracking wearables. Both involve, say Crawford and her co-authors, a moral epistemology in which only by accurately and even scientifically measuring bodily conditions can one lead a good life. There is an assumption at play here, that numerical accuracy is the most immediate path to truth and self-knowledge. Crawford et al. discussed some examples of vintage weight scale ads, as well as those of contemporary self-tracking technologies. Both, they find, seem to put forward, quote, the belief that the better the data, 
the better the quality of self-knowledge, and so a better human is created, end quote. Recent years have shown how data leakages and data exhaust from wearable tracking technologies can raise considerable ethical issues. Some of these issues stem from any technologies that are location-based. As D'Souza e Silva and Frith point out, significant privacy issues can arise when geographical location gets joined with person-based information. Digital surveillance extends from your personal identity to your personal position in space. One interesting case was the accidental release of sensitive information about the location and staffing of military bases and spy outposts around the world. Health tracking app Strava's data visualization map, which shows all tracked user activity, included, for example, a very clear visualization of the U.S. military base in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, clearly demarcated by the routes taken repeatedly by jogging personnel. Crawford et al. highlight black mirror-like but entirely plausible scenarios in which self-tracking data might be used in legal proceedings. Might it be possible to obtain health data via a court order, for example, to substantiate or disprove contentious insurance claims? Or perhaps tracking data might help establish an alibi or demonstrate a suspect's proximity to a murder scene? In the past year or two, we've heard rather well-articulated arguments about how health data should be private, except perhaps if they're going to be using that data to combat public health threats. These kinds of developments, which, if not already here, are near on the horizon, will surely test our trust in institutions, not to mention our willingness and ability to challenge the authority of the platforms controlling this biometric and locational data. We should also remember that self-tracking might not always be something one can easily opt out of. Recent Amazon patents show designs for a wristband that could precisely track where warehouse employees are placing their hands. And get this, it would also use vibrations to nudge the hands in different directions. The concept is meant to streamline fulfillment of orders and, of course, add in another layer of surveillance at work. In the next episode, we shift registers just a little, turning our attention to the idea that media technologies have become more participatory and the contradictory consequences this seems to have had for politics. So, until then, I'm Scott Rogers, and you've been listening to Media, Technology, and Culture.